I began seeing soldiers with unexplained shortness of breath in 2004 following their deployments in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. All were physically fit at the time of deployment, but were quite short of breath on return. They were incapable of completing their two-mile runs within regulation time, which meant they no longer met the Army physical fitness standards. Fort Campbell referred dozens of us, dozens of similarly affected soldiers to Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and as a result, we became leaders in evaluating and understanding this condition. The soldiers referred underwent standard testing, including chest radiographs, pulmonary function testing, exercise studies, all of which were normal and therefore failed to explain their exercise limitation. This led us to perform surgical biopsies, which consistently exhibited characteristics of toxic inhalation. Most of the biopsies demonstrated a condition known as constrictive bronchiolitis affecting the small airways, but there were other multiple pathologic features demonstrating toxic inhalation. You may wonder why these earlier studies failed to detect these changes and the answer is that diseases affecting the small airways are frequently missed with non-invasive tests and are only diagnosed with biopsy, something that has been known for over 40 years. Since uh, forces deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq, DOD has known that burn pits similar to Dow Chemical and probably DOD knowing about Agent Orange. DOD has known that burn pits release toxic blooms into the air. There are memos, one dating back to 2006 near the beginning of, of the, the Iraq war, or around soon after, containing phrases like an acute health hazard for individuals, another phrase, possibility for chronic health hazards associated with smoke, another, the known carcinogens and respiratory sensitizers released from the atmosphere present both an acute and a chronic health hazard to our troops and our local population. Unquote these, um, but the burn pits continued the size of football fields is my understanding. Air quality testing at Bagram Airfield found that air samples were considered, quote, unhealthy by EPA, EPA standards. So Dr. Rausch, walk me through the department's thinking here. If we have weekly air sample data from burn pits that routinely show particulate matter exceeding EPA health standards, DOD shared that raw data with VA or outside experts to build a comprehensive picture of what, uh, what our service members, civilians, contractors, and the local populations were exposed to. So what? What, what, walk me through this. What's the problem? Well, the department's p position is um, in response, really, to um, I believe it was on on your on the House side that requested a report from the from the department, which is due February, on alternatives to burn pit uh, technology, alternatives to burn pits in the deployed uh, in the deployed environment. So um, that report is uh, still ongoing in terms of the analysis and the proposed solutions, but the department is moving away from open per burn pits. Well, as they should have. These deployers were striking. All of them faced dismissal from the military with a label of unexplained shortness of breath, which does not qualify as a diagnosis and therefore does not meet the standard for disability. Are we looking at other ways our veterans or our service members are being exposed to toxic chemicals that could have an effect? Are we doing that in a proactive way or are we just wait until we have these devastating effects to their health? We're looking very proactive. We learned a lot from Agent Orange. Uh, that's the unfortunate reality. We are looking at burn pits proactively. Um, we are actually looking at the health effects right now um, with the National Academy. They're doing a report that we will have next October. Uh, we know that intergenerational effects are of concern to veterans also, and we just had an intergenerational effects <coughs> report that came to us from the National Academy. The results of our initial 80 patients were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in August 2011. Vanderbilt University has now evaluated over 250 deployers with unexplained shortness of breath. I'm concerned that the DOD continues to use open burn pits when we know there are serious medical consequences for our troops. We've had millions of service members deployed to areas in which the DOD's own tests show the air are, is not safe to breathe. And um, we are, in effect, repeating mistakes that we've made in the past with um, our Agent Orange veterans. 100 of them have had surgical biopsies, all of which are abnormal. Other major medical centers have reported similar biopsy results. 
the DOD stampede trial reported that the standard clinical evaluations failed to ex explain the respiratory complaints in 40 percent of patients presenting with shortness of breath. These patients were similar to the, the patients that we saw at Vanderbilt, but they did not undergo biopsy. A large number of deployers report respiratory symptoms associated with deployment. So I think you're seeing uh, a real flourishing of information and in scientific high quality research that's coming out about what might be associated uh, with, let's start with the unexplained shortness of breath and decreased exercise tolerance that many of our veterans have reported since their deployment to Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, I think at this point, there's, there are multiple potential causes, um, the burn pit smoke being one of them. Uh, the ambient air quality was actually highlighted by the National Academy's report in 2011 as uh, maybe the most likely source of, of a problem for, for those service members. Um, and our own work more recently has actually highlighted the possibility of blast overpressure as being a contributing factor, at least in some individuals' um, experience of shortness of breath. Uh, I, so I think that there are, there's a lot of good science that's being done, and we're getting a better understanding of what the causal factors might be. And so I would just, uh, you know, before a presumption is, is determined, perhaps we should understand a little better about why. We have to meet criteria for straightforward diagnoses such as asthma, sinusitis, allergic rhinitis. But the patients of, referred to Vanderbilt uh, were more complicated. And they had been dismissed by clinicians who had limited experience with this presentation, and they misinterpreted their normal preoperative uh, evaluations. The absence of a diagnosis was unsettling to those veterans who were affected. What is the burden of proof on them to show that there's a connection between service and illness? It would vary by... <coughs> It would be, vary by the illness, but I'd be very happy to get um, the information from VBA or arrange for them to give you a well, briefing. Well, give, give me an example. Like, what, what is a, because I think that it, it, it is quite a high burden for the veteran to show the connection. How to best medically evaluate those with this presentation. The surgical biopsies may explain symptoms, but performing them on a regular basis is not practical. They are invasive and expensive. They may, however, provide clarity for a veteran whose symptoms are unrelenting and severe enough to, enter, to end their medical service and whose symptoms have been dismissed by previous providers. The DOD and VA should consider designating centers of excellence to evaluate deployers with unexplained shortness of breath. These centers would establish standard protocols for evaluating these symptoms and determine who may need a surgical biopsy and who may be eligible for a presumptive diagnosis of deployment-related lung injury. The second issue relates to disability benefits for deployers who have been diagnosed with a deployment-related lung disease. Well, I, the health we, issues. Share, we share information with the, with the VA all the time. I, I can't say it was years and years. Well, I, but, I, I, okay, I, I would really like to know some ago. of those comments made that I quoted in other other data from DOD to make sure. I would like to know when, in fact, that was shared with the VA. First, quite for first point, and if you would get that to us, I will. Um, at some point, um, you know, I'd like to know what local po what local population we're exposed to. Uh, that is really important. We go into these war zones. We leave behind lots of things. Um, some toxic, sometimes a better life for people, but sometimes you get it. Senator Manchin asked about, you know, it took us a long time, but we learned something from Agent Orange. We were too slow. Elected officials were too slow. VA, we were all too slow. DOD knew more than they told all those things. But we know that burn pits are, are exposure to burn pits is a very serious thing, resulting in illness and sometimes death. So are we, are we going to do a presumption of service connection in list diseases on burn pits? If we are, when, and why not yet? I do not. I don't know if a presumption will be necessary. We may be able to do it on an individual basis. The current VA standard does not allow a disability rating for veterans with biopsies showing inhalation lung injury when pulmonary function tests are normal. This is inconsistent with the report of the U.S. Defense Health Board, which states that pulmonary function testing usually fails to detect small airways. 
make three real quick comments. First of all, I, there, does, there seems to be a lack of urgency in all of this as people contract, get, get, get sick and die in far too many cases. And every time we wait to add names to the presumption, to the, to the list, to the, elgin, to the Agent Orange presumptive eligibility list, every time we talk about this with burn pits, it, 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 another day goes by in people's lives. Um, that's one point. Dr. Hastings used the word requirement. Um, well, there is no requirement. Congress should pass a requirement, but you can move on a requirement of, of beginning to compile which diseases should, in fact, be on this list. And third, that you made a statement that, and I'm not, you don't need to respond to this now, as I said, I'm over time, but you made a statement that, that the VA, that, that we don't know if we need presumptive eligibility. We, we can handle each one, and that's the whole point. If we handle each one, it just slows everything down. That's what we tried to do with Agent Orange for, I don't know, two decades or whatever until Congress and the VA and the public and the DAV and the VFW, the American Legion and the Polish American Vets and all figured this out that we need presumptive eligibility. So those are just my three assertions that I hope you take into account. 2007 through 2018, there were 11,500 burn pit claims lodged with the VA. Out of those, over 9,000 or 80% were denied. Uh, my staff has been working with your staff on trying to get a little granularity on why uh, the majority of these claims are denied. But can you go into a little bit more detail from your perspective? I know it's individual ones, but that's a pretty high number. And maybe you could submit for the record to the committee here in a little bit more detail than you have with a minute left in my questioning on on why you think uh, that pretty high majority of claims is denied, at least at this juncture. Sir, I'd be very happy to, sir, I'd be very happy to go ahead and get that information for you um, on the number of claims that are, are covered and not covered. Um, if it would not be inappropriate, I'd also like to just answer your other question just a little oh, bit sure. in regards to. But do you have a, do you have an answer to my first question? Just your, kind your of first question. 80%. I, I do not. I would have to look at what the um, the um, the reasons were. I know that the, in the top ten reasons um, that people put in a burn pit claim, some of them do not seem like they would be related to burn pits. Okay. But I don't have the medical records and review. Some are complaining of irritable bowel syndrome. Some people are complaining of migraines. Um, the the sinusitis and the breathing problems. Those are pretty easy to connect. Some of the others that would be harder connect, to connect would be things that weren't associated with the respiratory system, but I would be very Got happy it. to talk to VBA and get that information Good. for you. Good. That would be helpful. Patients with deployment-related lung disease represent a unique group of, group of veterans. While this injury may not be as noticeable as loss of limb, respiratory disorders are associated with lifetime limitation. It has been 10 years since I presented our preliminary data to this committee. I hope that it is evident that this issue is not a transient one for our veterans and that too many of them with this disorder feel that they are not receiving proper health care or appropriate disability benefits. Pits, other environmental exposures. Walk me through examples of what you've seen while treating patients. And in, in your clinical opinion, do you think DOD and VA have the protocols in place to correctly diagnose these respiratory illnesses? There's probably two phases to what we have seen. Early on in 2004, we saw a free flow of patients from Fort Campbell who returned from a one-year service in Iraq with unexplained shortness of breath. And there was good cooperation at that time, and that's when we made our original finding of constrictor bronchiolitis. Over time, it, these uh, service members have become more complicated. They're farther out from service. Um, we're not seeing as many direct referrals from Fort Campbell as we used to. A lot of them have seen other providers who are not familiar with this. Or have, they have, stopped, have they stopped referring veterans to specialists? They stopped referring to Vanderbilt and other academic institutions and chose to refer to DOD facilities. Are they getting the care they should? I think that if you were to go to one of the centers that they were referring to, you would get a different evaluation than you might get with us or with other academic medical centers. We 
we felt like that we were able to characterize those patients who were diagno ultimately diagnosed with deployment-related lung disease. They had a consistent pattern of exercise limitation, and despite their pulmonary function tests and exercise studies being normal, we were willing to take this a step further and get them a diagnosis with lung biopsies. I would say that except in rare circumstances, the DOD facilities did not do that. Okay. Thank you for that, Mr. Learman. Thank you for being in front of this committee. In your um, opening statement, and uh, it really relates somewhat to the discussion you just had with Senator Brown on some of the referrals going to facilities that may or may not have the same level of expertise. So in your mind, waving a wand, what would a good network of centers of excellence look like? And, and I would assume that that would be in, in and out of the DOD or VA. I think it could be in or out of DOD and VA, but I think that for patients with unexplained shortness of breath, which are a large number of, of the large number of patients with respiratory disorders, there is an unfamiliarity that you can be ill, that you can have toxic inhalation with a normal x-ray and pulmonary function test. There is also an unwillingness to take it to the next level to either do a lung biopsy or to say, you have the characteristics of people who have been diagnosed with deployment-related lung disease, and we think that you meet those criteria. So you need the expertise, but you also need the willingness to take it to that level. So some of that may require us to do a better job of educating service members who were in potential at-risk situations to, under, to understand what they may be going through and that getting getting advice or engaging uh, experts in the area. That, that's more a matter of increasing awareness and engagement on the part of the service member? It's more of uh, increasing the awareness among providers. Got the, the typical person that I'm seeing now is somebody who has seen multiple providers, some of them in the private world, some of them through DOD, some of them through VA. The DOD and VA providers frequently are aware of what we have done at Vanderbilt or has been done in, in National Jewish in Colorado, but they don't take it to the level that we do. And the service members leave with a diagnosis that we're sorry that you're short of breath, your x-rays and pulmonary function tests are normal. Do you, um, you mentioned that the referrals uh, reduced to Vanderbilt and in favor of, I guess, DOD Health. Uh, do, do you know why that happened? Do you know, do, or is there any speculation on why that happened? I think you would have to ask them. Um, we I, will. I, th I, think that, I think that they were uncomfortable with the idea that we would do lung biopsies on somebody who had normal x-rays and pulmonary function tests. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that that is a leap for me as a clinician to have made that diagnosis. Uh, and it's one that when I see patients, I tell them that it is unconventional. But in this group of patients, it uh, has a very high yield. I appreciate your guys' testimony, and I really appreciate your work. And you talked about the studies you're doing. But ultimately, decisions have to be made. Um, I think Senator Brown touched on this. I, I often think that there's an adversarial relationship between the VA and the veterans. And I don't think that's your guys' intent. But the truth is we got folks out there that are dying, that were put in positions that they got them that way. I'm a farmer. I could get hit by a tractor and get killed any time. That's my choice. These folks were put in positions, you folks, you're probably all military, right, at one time or another, were, were put in positions that you had no control over. We have an obligation to deal with these folks in a timely manner. You do good work. We need to make sure that your work results in decisions, not just reports. And I just want to thank you for being here today.